Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who is still waiting for his invitation aboard Jerry Jones's yacht. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Come on, Jerry. I'm going to brain my dinghy. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are excited to be featuring Tex Hex Brujas Beer by the good folks over at Shiner's Beers in Big and Beautiful, Texas. This is an IPA brewed with cactus water featuring Amarillo hops. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's a shout out to some of our beautiful listeners that helped us out with this week's beer run. First up, we have a cheers to Melanie in Great Falls, Montana. Big shout out to Brandy in DeSoto, Missouri. Next up, we have a cheers to Manda in Williston, North Dakota. And a big we like your jib to Laura in Normal, Illinois. Not so normal, Illinois. And we also have a shout to Lori in La Grand, Oregon. And last but certainly not least, we have Bianca in Hudson, Florida. Everyone we just mentioned helped us out with this week's beer fun. They went to truecrimegarage.com and clicked on the donate button. And for that, well, we thank you. Yeah. Who? Ha! Thank you. Thank you for all you do. BWWRUN Beer Run. Thanks for supporting us. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for sharing our show on social media. It's a great way to keep the show going. You want you want more episodes? Huh? Do ya? Do ya? You want to keep hearing our nasally drones in your earballs? Do ya? Then tell a friend. Goes a long way. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody. Gather around. Grab a chair. Grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. We all are someone's child. Many of us have children of our own. We raise our children and do the very best that we can to help them to grow up to be good and kind. A wise man once told me that you cannot be too hard on your children, but you also cannot be their best friend. And it's a parent's duty to raise their children up to be good citizens. And to do so, Your role as a parent should fall somewhere right in the middle of disciplinarian and best friend. This week's subject is a missing persons case. Here 
our missing person was really just starting to come of age. And this young man's life was really just starting to take shape. No longer was he a boy. He was becoming a man with dreams, goals, and responsibilities all of his own. He was becoming a good contributing member of society. He was a good citizen, just as his parents had raised him to be. Gregory Keith Mann Jr. was 20 years old when he went missing. Recently, he had moved into his own apartment, not terribly far from his parents' house. He was striking out on his own with a new job that could turn into a career and a fiancé who had just finished college. He went by his middle name, Keith. Gregory Mann was his father's name, and so to friends, family, and colleagues, he was Keith. But with all of these new beginnings in Keith's life, there was so much more going on and so many more moving pieces. I'm sure Keith was looking forward to things settling down soon and settling into his adult life and the life that he was building and the love that he and his fiance would build together. Who is to say what would have come of any of this? Keith's relationship or his new job? We don't know. And very sadly I say, we will never know. Keith disappeared sometime between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. on May 11, 1997. This after returning to his apartment in Wichita Falls, Texas. He has never been heard from again. The Wichita Falls Times Record News covered the case extensively over the years. Newspaper coverage in a case that no one could have anticipated would go unsolved and unresolved for 25 years now. I'll read you portions of one of the very first news articles in Keith's case. The headline was simple and to the point and read, Police Searching for Wichita Falls Man. The article reads, Police are searching for a 20-year-old man who was last seen Saturday night at the Fountain Gate Apartments on Barnett Road. Friends dropped Keith Mann Jr. off in the parking lot of the apartment complex around midnight. He has not been seen since. Police Lieutenant Laura Arnold said authorities have no evidence of foul play. When he was last seen, Keith was wearing an ivory-colored shirt, blue jeans, and a beige baseball hat. Keith was driving a 1994 red Mustang with dealer tags days prior to his disappearance. The vehicle was found early Sunday morning in a parking lot next to his parents' house. Anyone with information should contact the Criminal Investigations Division of the Wichita Falls Police Department. Now notice, in that report, it is stated that the authorities have no evidence of foul play. That does not mean that foul play was not suspected. As with most cases, theories change, sometimes overnight, and sometimes no evidence can become evidence of a different kind, just with the passing of time. The question of foul play in this case, whether or not it should be suspected, changed rather quickly. And make no mistake about it, today, as the case stands, Foul play is very much suspected. Because if it were not for someone, or what seems more probable, someone's out there, well then Keith would still be here with us now. Still working on those dreams, goals, and responsibilities today. Probably fulfilling some of them over the years and creating new ones as he grew. While it saddens me to report that we are coming up on 25 years now that Keith has been missing, I am hopeful that for Keith's family and his real, true friends, that soon we may have some answers. You see, this is not a cold case. Sure, it's been a little chilly over the years, but not cold and never frigid. Wichita Falls Police Department have worked the case hard and intelligently over the years. Detectives have managed to stir up several good leads every so often to keep the case alive.
This case is very active. And with the 25 year anniversary of the day that this young man went missing approaching us on the calendar, the case is heating up once again with renewed interest from everyone, including law enforcement and the media. We here at True Crime Garage are very happy to be a part of that renewed interest and awareness in Keith's case. And we sincerely hope and pray that us talking about this case here in the garage this week will in some way, big or small, help. Help to get much needed and deserved answers for a grieving family. There are many in the Wichita Falls community that have never forgotten about Keith Mann Jr., including the police department. The current detective working the case told us, guys, let me be clear. This is a very open and active police investigation. I am also happy to report that the reward for information in this case is increasing with the 25 year anniversary. Suspects and witnesses are being interviewed again. Leads are being chased and the tips that are sure to come pouring in will be followed up on. Personally, I firmly believe and have reason to believe that not only does more than one person know what happened to Keith, it's likely more than one person played a role in Keith's disappearance. I am looking forward to what new information may come, and I believe one day murder charges will be issued in this case. This week, we are featuring the unsolved case of Keith Mann Jr., who has been missing from Wichita Falls, Texas since May of 1997. This is True Crime Garage. This week we find ourselves once again in the great state of Texas for another true crime story. This one a missing persons case now 25 years old out of Wichita Falls. With a population of right around 100,000 people, Wichita Falls is located in the northern portion of Texas, not far from the state line. In fact, Wichita Falls is only about 15 minutes south of the Oklahoma-Texas border. Our story takes place back in 1997. Now, before we go through the details leading up to Keith's disappearance, we need to go through some background information in this case. Keith Mann Jr. was born on February 19, 1977. So at the time of his disappearance, he was just 20 years old. As a little kid, Keith was a sweet child, and his love of sports came at a young age. He loved sports of any kind. He also fell in love with motorcycles when he was a little older. Keith's mother and father did not live together, and Keith lived with his mother when he was little. When he would go visit his dad, they had little mini bikes, and the two of them would spend the day riding around town for hours. The summer before ninth grade, Keith decided to live with his dad and stepmom and go to high school. Some of this decision for Keith wanting to live with his father is obviously to become closer with his dad and his stepmom, but some of this decision came about because of the baseball program at the high school where his father lived. Keith loved baseball and was not ready to give up on baseball. He did not want for high school to be the last of his baseball playing days. And the high school near his father's home had a good baseball program, good enough that some of the kids that played on that team would go on to play at the collegiate level. So Keith made the difficult decision to change schools at an age when many have no desire to do so. He was now living in Wichita Falls, Texas with his father and stepmother. He attended Ryder High School, where he got good grades and excelled on the ball field. Keith played baseball, loved sports, and was very active in school, but it seems like baseball was his primary focus. Keith was good enough at baseball that he earned a scholarship. When he graduated from Ryder High School back in 1995, Keith went on to attend North Central Texas Junior College on that scholarship. This college is about an hour and a half away from Wichita Falls. 
Yes, North Central Junior College is located in Gainesville, Texas. Now, Keith went to that college for one year, where he was very well liked and seemed to have no known enemies. There he played baseball, but playing time was scarce, and Keith started to seek out another change in his life. But although the baseball wasn't panning out for him in Gainesville, going off to college was not a total loss. In fact, far from it, because while he was there at North Central, Keith met Carrie Kitchens, and the two fell for each other. Their relationship would blossom into something stronger. Kerry was there to play volleyball and Keith to play baseball, so they had sports in common, as well as some mutual friends. This would blossom into a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. And while the boyfriend-girlfriend relationship would continue, Keith's baseball days were coming to an end. After a year of college, Keith decided to move back to Wichita Falls. He moved in with his parents, dad and stepmom, and lived with them for about four months or so. Keith's story is very similar to most college students. They go away, they live at college, it's not working out, he's coming back home to be with his family. Yes, this will put him back in Wichita Falls, which once there, he's going to live with his parents from roughly January till April. So this is all still in 1997. During that time period, Keith would pick up a new job, one that he liked, and surprisingly, he fit right into the position that one might not think would appeal to someone with Keith's personality. So we need to give you a little background on his personality. And this is as it's been described to us. Keith's personality was that he was a nice young man, well-liked and smart. However, everyone says that he was shy and not very outgoing. Some of his family say Keith may have had some bouts with anxiety. So when I hear those sorts of things, it's really a surprise to me to hear that Keith took a job as a salesperson at a car dealership. Usually these are more outgoing personality types the happy-go-lucky talking types. And Keith, as said, was a little more reserved and shy, as his parents said. According to his family, Keith really liked the job. He started this job working as a salesperson at a dealership called Ron Roberts Ford, which was located in Wichita Falls. Keith started working there approximately eight weeks before he vanished. And as said, Keith liked the job, he was fitting in, and more importantly, he was selling cars, so he had some success. Three weeks after he started working at Ron Roberts Ford, and after showing some success and good work ethic, Keith was eligible for the dealership's demo program. This is a kind of commonplace practice where the dealership will allow employees to sign out vehicles and drive them after work hours. Well, even though he was shy, I mean, the nice thing about working at a car dealership is the customers are coming to you. As long as you know what you're talking about, you got a reason to talk. In April of 97, Keith made another change. This when he moved into an apartment of his own, located only about a mile away from his parents' place. And as we said, an apartment of his own, but He would not be living there for very long all by himself because Keith and Carrie, they've recently gotten engaged. And after she was going to finish with school, she was going to move in with Keith. In fact, she was scheduled to move in on May 11th. This just hours after Keith went missing. Yeah, so even though baseball didn't work out or college didn't work out, he's back at home. He finds a job. He has an apartment. He's getting engaged. His girlfriend's going to move in with him. He's he's starting his life. I mean, he's on the upswing. Yes, and let's break down this timeline a little further in, in a recap, if you will. Keith starts the new job at the dealership in early to mid-March of 1997. Then Keith moved into his apartment at the Fountain Gate apartment complex. He moved into the apartment in April. This apartment, again, is only about a mile away from his parents' home. So he is there at the apartment starting in April. And remember, he and Carrie recently engaged. Carrie's going to be moving in with him on May 11th, the same day that he went missing. Keith went missing sometime between the hours of midnight after being dropped off by his friends and 6 a.m. the next morning when the vehicle that Keith was driving was found abandoned. 
Carrie, his girlfriend and fiance, was planning on arriving at the apartment on the afternoon of the 11th, that same day. And since she was finished with college and the two were engaged, she was going to be staying at the apartment, moving in and living there starting on that day. So we have some pretty good background information. Everything leading up to the time frame that is very important here, and this is the last few days before Keith vanished. We should talk about foul play, though, Captain, because we brought it up in the trailer, and we've touched on it a little bit, and I want to get into this before we get into the more detailed timeline of the days leading up to his disappearance because I don't want there to be a foul play versus no foul play debate going forward. So the earliest news article says... Police have found no evidence of foul play. This is just the article that comes out a couple days after he's missing. However, if you were to ask his family, and we did, they will tell you that Keith didn't just up and walk away from his life and his family. They did say that with Keith and the fiance moving in together at the same weekend that he went missing, that certainly was an early suspicion of theirs. Right. It sounds like to me, Captain, the early suspicion of pretty much everyone, including law enforcement, was that maybe he had gotten cold feet and decided that he didn't want to get married or didn't want to live together. And so that he would just kind of go away for a little bit, giving her the hint that maybe this isn't going to work out or, hey, I've had a change of mind. But as the days went on, they very quickly, his family and law enforcement changed their suspicions of that to actually, we think that there was foul play involved because Keith is not here anymore. And so one thing we should give a little background on is that remember we said Keith and his Keith's mother and father didn't live together. Keith's father remarried when he was only two years old. His mother lives all the way in New Mexico. And when Keith was a little boy, he would live with his mom and visit his father. His father lived in New Mexico when he was a little boy with his new stepmother. At some point, dad and stepmom moved to Wichita Falls, Texas. We know that this is before Keith went off to high school because he gets his eye on that high school with the good baseball program in dad's neighborhood all the way in Wichita Falls, Texas, and decides, hey, I'm going to move out there and live with dad and my stepmom, Deborah. So the thought here, Captain, was that maybe he gets cold feet about the fiance moving in, decides maybe he doesn't want to be engaged anymore, what have you, and maybe he ran off to mom's house in New Mexico. You know, anybody that has parents that live separate homes and especially this far away from one another, you kind of have a safe haven to retreat to should things not be going your way. Right. So very quickly, what they're able to do is they're able to kind of squash those suspicions by first contacting his mother. I've not seen him. I've not heard from him. He's not staying with me is the response they get. And when they don't have any confirmation of Keith being anywhere else other than where he should be at that apartment and then going off to his job just like he would on any other ordinary day, their suspicions from, well, no foul play to foul play shift rather quickly. Like you said, by not being there, maybe it scares off your fiance, but not showing up to work. Now you could potentially lose your job, which then would cause you to lose your apartment as well. So you're basically everything that you've just built in this last year going to be wiping the slate clean and starting all over. The thing here too, Captain, is we have that statement by police early on that says we have no evidence of foul play. The scary thing is when your suspicion changes of, well, he, there must have been foul play because he's not with us. He's disappeared. Somebody must be responsible for whatever happened to him. Well, the scary part is then you start going, okay, we have no evidence of foul play because either A, someone did a really good job of covering up what they had done, or B, we don't know where and when the foul play occurred. So we don't know where to look for the evidence of foul play. 
Let's dive into the timeline and events that led to the disappearance. Right. So we've covered the months and weeks leading up to the disappearance, but now we're going to go into the actual days leading up to it. And of course, the major time frame that we are going to be concerned with in Keith's disappearance is the window that we have referenced, but will once again emphasize here that is starting at approximately 1145 p.m. on Saturday night and then goes until 6 a.m. Sunday morning when we know his vehicle was already parked and abandoned at that parking spot near his parents' home. And we'll get into those details now. So on Thursday, May 8th, what we have here, plain and simple, ordinary day, Keith goes to work, and then he drives to his parents' home in Wichita Falls. His apartment's in Wichita Falls, as well, about a mile away. He drops by the parents' house. He parks on the street, according to his family. Mm -hmm. this, is, this will be key information later, so make note of that. On that Thursday, May 8th, he parks on the street, and his mom and dad say that he is driving a pickup truck that day. Remember, he's a part of this dealership demo program, so he will regularly be driving different vehicles. He can take vehicles whatever vehicle his manager will allow him to sign out right. for that day. So they say on that day, he dropped by the house briefly before going to his apartment for the night. He was driving a pickup truck and he parked on the street on Friday, May 9th, his girlfriend and fiance Carrie had just graduated from junior college where they had met. Your mom goes to college. So he goes and his parents go to the graduation ceremony followed by a dinner. Remember the college is an hour and a half away and we have Keith who drives separately and we have his parents who take their vehicle. They all drive out to Wichita falls and it's kind of like convoy style, right? They're, they're traveling separately, but they're basically following each other there and following each other back. So they have dinner, they go to the graduation and then they return back to Wichita Falls. At some point during the return trip, they say that, you know, Keith has to go his separate way to his apartment and they continue on to their home. This will unfortunately be the last time that his parents, his dad, Gregory Keith Mann, and his stepmother, Deborah Mann, would see Keith. One thing that I found weird here, Captain, was it's my understanding that one of Keith's sisters, he had younger sisters, one of his sisters, at least one of them, rode with him to the graduation. Right. So they're in the car for roughly an hour and a half together. And later, his sister, I believe she was about 12 or so, said that he seemed distracted that whole night to her. And... It's my understanding that she did not ride home with them because she would go home with her parents, and we know that they went their separate ways at some point on that trip home. This leads us to Saturday, May 10th, and this will be the key day here to really pay attention to all of these movements. So the story has always been this. Remember, he's employed at that Ron Roberts Ford. At that time, it was located on Jacksboro Highway in Wichita Falls. So this is back in 97. He reported for work on that Saturday, May 10th, and he had a good day. He sold two vehicles. Keith had plans to deliver one of the vehicles on Monday. Mm -hmm. The dealership allowed him to drive home a vehicle for the night, and Keith selected a red 1996 Ford Mustang and requested a gasoline voucher as he did not have any cash at the time. It is believed that that he filled the car's tank after leaving work that evening at 9 p.m. using the voucher. Keith returned to his residence at the Fountain Gate Apartments on Barnett Road. He spoke to his fiance on the telephone, and this has always been reported to be around 9.30 p.m. that evening. Keith told her that his friends were picking him up to go out for the evening. Remember, Keith and Carrie planned to meet the following day as mm -hmm. she was moving in. To bring everybody up to speed here, Carrie already has a key to the apartment. So Keith, from my understanding, wasn't going to start the lease on the apartment until May 1st. 
but it was one of those situations where the previous occupants had moved out early. Landlord calls up Keith and says, Hey, the apartment's available whenever you want it. And he decided to move in early. So he moved in sometime in April. Well, Carrie still away at college. She's spending her, some of the time on her weekends driving items and personal belongings of hers to the apartment. And so she's already loading things into the apartment during the weekends leading up to his disappearance and plan to move in permanently on May 11th, the following day. We should point out that Carrie was with her family in Dallas, Fort Worth on this Saturday. They, I believe they attended a concert. This was all still part of the celebration of her graduation. Her parents were really treating her to a nice weekend. So he's at his apartment, and it's always been reported that they spoke on the phone that night around 9.30 that evening. Pay attention to these times. Keith and his two friends, remember he's going to go out, and these two friends are Chris and Chris's fiance Michelle. They pick up Keith at his apartment. Keith works with Chris, and I've seen it reported that Michelle worked at the dealership as well. I'm not certain if that's 100% accurate, but I've seen it reported that way. We know for 100% that Chris, his buddy, worked at Ron Roberts Ford as well. After picking him up, they stop at a FINA gas station. This was located on McNeil Avenue. This is kind of a busy road in Wichita Falls. The business security camera videotape shows them go inside the store at 10 p.m., And we also know that Keith was there because he uses his fiance's FINA credit card at the gas station to buy some snacks. Right. Chris was older. Remember, Keith is only 20, so he's not old enough to buy beer. But Chris, he's a little bit older. I think two years older than Keith. So he's going to buy some beer for the group. After this, they visited a McDonald's restaurant before going mudding in one of the dealership's cars that Chris had borrowed for the evening. This is kind of a weird part of the story, right? Because what we're going to have here, Captain, is Keith will vanish shortly after hanging out with these two friends. So we really should put everything they say and all of their movements under a microscope as we're going through this timeline here. And... Part of this timeline is Chris and Michelle saying that we are going mudding. What I found weird about this is that they were borrowing a vehicle from the dealership to go mudding in. That doesn't seem incredibly responsible. Sounds like something the captain would do. It sounds like you're setting yourself up to do damage to the vehicle and you're either going to have to pay out of pocket or lose your job or both. But again, they're all in their early 20s and... It sounds like something people would do in their early 20s, just not well thought out. Some people do some dumb stuff. I've got dumb stuff planned for this evening. After they went mudding, now Chris wants to clean off the vehicle, right? So they go to a car wash where they're going to hose it down. And during this time period, it's always been reported that Keith says to Chris and Michelle that he needed to go home soon because he was meeting someone at 12 15 a.m there's some debate on what happens here because it's always been reported that keith did not mention the person's name or the location of the meeting or why they were meeting to to begin with yeah very suspicious very creepy part of the story His friends drop him off, and Chris and Michelle say that they saw Keith walk up the stairs toward his apartment at approximately 11.45 p.m. that night, but they did not see Keith enter his residence. He has never been heard from again. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. 
Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. All right, we are back to the windows, to the walls. Cheers to everybody out there. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. If we were 20 years younger, we would pick up some beers and go mudding tonight. Yeah, done and done. Done and done. All right. Uh, so keep, Go ahead. So Thursday, he goes to work. He has a loaner car. He visits his parents. On Friday, they go uh, to this graduation, drive separate vehicles. On Saturday, he goes to work, sells some cars, and he goes out with his friends, and they drop him off at his apartment around midnight. Mm -hmm. How many individuals were there when they dropped him off? From my understanding, it's Chris and Michelle that are dropping him off. The same two that picked him up, the same two that he went to the gas station, McDonald's, and mudding with. Right. And to add a little more detail here, we have... Okay, so it, it's reported that Chris, he's on the dealership's demo program as well. And so he signed out a black Nissan Pathfinder. This is an SUV, especially in these days, you get an SUV, every young man is excited to take it off-roading, whether all these years later we learn that most of them are not built to go off-roading. But they get this Pathfinder and they go mudding. And according to the information I have here, Captain, is that they went to a place behind Memorial Stadium and they went mudding for approximately 45 minutes. And it's my understanding that this is a well-lit area. It's also a common area that people back then would take vehicles and go off-roading with them. They washed the vehicle at a local car wash on the way home. And then Keith, at some point, has told them, I'm meeting someone at 1215, does not say who he's meeting or where or why. Seems pretty late to be meeting somebody. It's very late, but he's 20 years old. He's been in his first apartment on his own for six weeks. Right. You know, people's hours get real weird when they don't live with mom and dad for the first few weeks. Yeah, or somebody could be dropping, just dropping by to see the apartment or dropping something off for his apartment. So to be clear here though, as far as law enforcement's concerned, it's always been reported in the public that Keith never said who he was meeting. It almost paints a picture of, he was trying to hide something, mm -hmm. trying to be secretive about something. However, law enforcement has told us and told a couple of other people that that's a little unclear to them because 
when asking Chris and Michelle to recount the night's events, both of them seemed to want to try to recall a name, almost like Keith had told them a name, but they just couldn't remember it. So we could just assume that maybe it was an individual that they just didn't know. Someone they didn't know. What I think is clear here, though, is they didn't know the location or the reason for the meeting. Keith may have said someone's name. He may have not. If you told me if we're hanging out at the bar and I go to drop you off at your house that you have to meet somebody, but it was somebody that I wasn't familiar with, I probably am less likely to remember their name. But if you said, oh, you know, our buddy uh, Todd or our buddy Paul, I'm going to meet them. Well, I'd remember that. When they drop him off, when they drop Keith off at his apartment, they drop him in the parking lot and he has to walk up the steps to his apartment. They say that they see him going up the steps, but do not see him enter the apartment. However, when he gets out of the Pathfinder, remember they picked up beers earlier that night at the gas station. Yeah, B-W-E-R-R-U-N, beer run. He took three of the beers with him, and this will be key because there's obvious signs later that he made it into his apartment, and one of the obvious signs is those three beers are later found on the counter inside of the apartment. Yeah, it seems like pretty solid evidence. The tricky thing here, though, is when they find the three beers, two are full and not open, and one of them has been open and has almost uh, get gone or it's half full. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, you can make what you want out of that, but it appears to me like he cracked open a beer, continued to sip on it. And at some point was interrupted or it left before we get into too much speculation. Let's get into Sunday, May 11th, the next day, Keith's parents noticed the Ford Mustang that he had borrowed from work. This is why we went into the detail of him parking on the street when he went to his family's house on that Thursday. That's key to me because Keith's parents noticed the Ford Mustang that he borrowed from work in a church parking lot near their home. This is near the 4300 block of McNeil Avenue. They noticed this vehicle there during the morning hours of May 11th. Remember, he's last seen just before midnight on May 10th. Now, I want to be clear here. At this point, when they see this vehicle there, they're not fully aware that it's Keith's vehicle. Remember, he can drive home a different vehicle each night. Right. This church is located very close to their home, and I don't have the exact distance from their home to this church parking lot where this vehicle was found. But I know that it's close enough in distance that the family has said we could see that parking spot, regardless of what car or vehicle was parked there. We could see that parking spot from at least one window in our home. So rather close to their home. And this is important because this was a parking spot that Keith used to use. He used this parking spot when he was in high school. He would use it when he would come from college and visit for the weekend or stay the night with his parents. This is because his parking spot was close enough that he could park the car in that spot and walk to their home and leave the vehicle there. Now, weeks before, remember he went and moved back in with mom and dad before moving into the apartment. Right. And it sounds like he was using that same parking spot during that time period. What happened was the church gets a new pastor and the pastor tells Keith's parents, mm. Hey, I don't want your son using our par our parking lot anymore. And his parents attend church there. So his dad, of course, is saying, Hey son, the, the new guy doesn't want you to park your car in their, in their lot anymore. Don't park there. And we know that that conversation took place based off of several factors, but one, piece of evidence of that is that he parked the truck on that Thursday in front of his parents' house on the street. So very weird that this Mustang is found in this parking spot that he used to use a lot, number one. And number two, it would be some time later that they would figure out that it was Keith's vehicle. So what happens is we have the first on record publicly 
sighting of this Ford Mustang in that parking spot around 6 a.m. This is when Keith's father goes out to get the newspaper from their driveway. Later that day, they went to church. His dad and stepmom go to church. Well, isn't that special? And after the services, this is around noon, they noticed that that vehicle was still there. Well, it kind of piqued their interest, so they went over and looked at it, and they could tell that it was a vehicle from Ron Roberts' Ford dealership. And it's also the parking spot that their son parks in. Right. So it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to put two and two together here to equal four. They figure, all right, well, we told Keith not to use this spot anymore. This is a Mustang, a loaner car from Ron Roberts Ford. He must have parked it here. Yeah, they're probably thinking that son of a bitch never listens to me. And we're going to get in trouble with the pastor now. Well, this might have raised a red flag or two, but it didn't really sound off any alarms for the parents. Again, he had used this spot plenty of times in the past, and they thought maybe he had just parked it there. Somebody picked him up that night and well, they just saw him a couple of days ago it, right and that he just left the vehicle there for whatever reason i'm sure they were probably going to give him the what for for parking there now what raises the red flag though is about an hour or so later when keith's fiance carrie calls his parents this is roughly in the one o'clock hour one in the afternoon she calls and she says hey I've been at the apartment for a while. Keith is not here. Remember, she has her own key. She's been moving things in periodically. Keith is not here. There's some beers on the counter, which is weird. He would have put them in the fridge. There's some dirty clothes in the bathroom on the floor. And when I arrived, the door was locked. His car, there was no car here, which... You know, she wouldn't, she likely would not have known what vehicle he was driving either, but maybe they had a designated parking spot. And she said that his bed was still made. It it looked like no one had slept in it by the time that she had arrived. And she had been there for some time and she was starting to get worried. So she called, initially called his parents just to see if he was at their house. Well, there's so many questions because you, the first question is, did somebody meet him at the apartment and they, left in in that vehicle or did he meet somebody at that church yeah and so now the parents knowing that the last time they saw him was with the fiance at the graduation and the graduation dinner and finding the vehicle in the church parking lot nobody being able to get a hold of keith mind you this is 97 keith did not have a cell phone and no pager Correct. And so this is when we start having major red flags go up. And it would be on Monday, May 12th, that Keith's parents would officially report him missing. So the Sunday is pretty uneventful. I mean, they don't know where Keith is and his girlfriend's trying to move into their apartment. And it's really hard to track him down because they actually don't know what vehicle he could be driving but they do see a vehicle from the car lot in a parking spot that he's known to park at. So let's discuss that Monday. Yeah, and keep in mind here what we got going on, right? For most of that Sunday, once they realize that he's missing, his parents, for the most part, just believe he probably went out partying with somebody, stayed up way too late, crashed on somebody's couch, and he's just unaccounted for It's really not until that evening, that Sunday evening or Sunday night, that they start to become worried. Now, Carrie has an uneasy feeling right away, and part of that is why she called his parents and said, hey, just thought maybe he would be over there. Once she discovers that he's not there, that uneasy feeling grows. And now she's concerned that something terrible has happened to her fiancé, Keith. So much so that she tells Keith's parents look, I don't feel comfortable staying here. Her parents live in El Paso, Texas. So Sunday night when he doesn't return, it's either stay at this apartment or drive all the way to El Paso. However, she contacts Keith's parents and says, I don't feel safe staying at this apartment alone. I don't know what happened to Keith or or why he is not here, but it could be something terrible. 
I could be in danger and not even know it. So can I stay with you? And so she stays at Keith's parents' house that Sunday night. In fact, she would continue to stay there for several weeks. She would go in and out of the apartment on occasion, but never staying there overnight as she didn't feel safe there. So we have Keith being officially reported missing on Monday the 12th. And I keep saying the word official here, Captain, because... Because you like to repeat yourself like a parrot? Well, we've been told that there was communication with the Wichita Falls Police Department before an official report was filed. I don't know if they told them they had to wait a certain amount of time or if they said, hey, give us a call in the morning and we'll come come by and take a, a report in person. But for the record, the official report was made on Monday, May 12th. Now, to fill in the blanks a little more on the fiance. You know, she was going to move in, and we also know that she was, she already had a job lined up. You know, she had finished college. She has the new apartment, new fiance. She had a job lined up, and she was to start her job on Monday, May 12th. But we know that she only stays in Wichita Falls for a couple of weeks after Keith goes missing. Now, on Monday morning, This is when they confirmed, his parents confirmed, that Keith had, in fact, borrowed the red Mustang that they found in the parking lot. They make a phone call and say, hey, we found this vehicle here. It's been left here. We know that it belongs to you guys. So his parents go by and take a visual kind of inspection of the vehicle. And just so everybody's clear, there is no sign of a struggle. There's no sign of a crime scene at his apartment. Correct. But same goes with this Mustang, right? There's nothing that suggests that there was some kind of struggle. There's no signs of blood. Right. So when the parents find the vehicle, the doors to the Mustang are locked. But the alarm system was never turned on for the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they called the dealership, hoping that somebody could come out with a second pair of keys and open up the vehicle to see if maybe Keith left a note or something inside. Unfortunately, the dealership did not have a second set of keys, so they had to call someone to get the, you know, to a locksmith to get the car doors open. And I guess they got the doors open rather quickly, but the problem became getting the vehicle to start to turn on the engine to drive the vehicle was very difficult, took several hours. The basic description we get of the vehicle comes from his parents and what they say is that it looked like the interior had been cleaned that none of keith's property was discovered inside the vehicle however there was an audio cassette that was found in the stereo i don't know if this has ever been confirmed or if anybody would be able to confirm if this audio cassette was keith's or not it could have simply been left there by somebody else that borrowed the vehicle at the dealership or the previous owner, whatever the cassette was, it's my understanding that the parents had listened to it at some point. And I believe that the cassette has been lost over the years. Again, it may not be any really, it may not hold really any evidentiary value at all. Yeah. The rumor was it was a weird Al Yankovic tape. Another one rides the bus. Yeah. But, uh, what they do is they eventually get the vehicle back to the dealership question for you not to cut you off here but when you when you say the vehicle seemed to be clean well wouldn't the vehicle be clean before keith takes it off the lot anyways correct i mean this car is a car that they are trying to sell at the dealership it right it would be silly for it not to be clean so it may just be as simple as he drove it home that night the dealership isn't terribly far from his apartment and Whoever moved it, whether it be Keith or somebody else, that the car was just used very little between the time that it left the dealership and that it was placed in that lot. Meaning why you wouldn't expect to find many, if any, of his personal belongings in the car, and you would expect the the car to be clean right? because it came from the lot. Now, the weird thing here, and this is something that I've not been able to really wrap my head around on, on having an opinion on if this means anything at all. But what we have, Captain, is Chris, Keith's friend that worked at the dealership, calls Keith's father 
and says, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know that when we received the vehicle back here, the driver's side seat was pushed all the way back. And Chris was taller than Keith and said that any time he got into a vehicle after Keith did, he always had to push the seat back because Keith was only five foot, six inches tall. Right. According to the story that we received from Keith's father is that it was Chris that made that phone call to alert them that, hey, this might be something. The car seat was pushed all the way back. We do need to keep in mind, though, Chris is receiving this information secondhand himself by the actual by another person that worked there that received the car that checked it in what i could not find was a report or anyone with a statement of who was the person that returned the vehicle to the dealership it may just be as simple as yeah was it big john stud that works in the back right the the car seat could have been found in a different setting than once it received the dealership right sitting in that parking lot old andre the giant had to return the car sitting in that parking lot. It could have been in a setting for a, a shorter individual and a taller person drove it back to the dealership. And that would explain that or whoever placed the vehicle in the parking lot was taller than Keith Mann. We were able to speak with Keith's parents, Gregory Mann and Deborah Mann and get some further insights into Keith's still unsolved case. Here we ask them to explain to us the emotional toll that this has taken on them and their family. But yeah, we, we missed out on a lot. And, and also, I think it's just the repercussions, you know, it caused a lot of things to be different um, by us going through this all these years. Um, it, it really affected our daughters. Um, they probably grew up differently than what they would have because one was like in sixth grade. The other one was probably like in fourth. So, you know, we got real protective of them. You know, we didn't want them, you know, going anywhere without us or, you know, even playing out, out front in front yard. You know, we were scared. We didn't know what this had to do with. And we had a lot of people, you know, would go down our street and kind of drive real slow and be looking at our house. But we didn't know if, you know, if that was just you know, onlookers or if that was somebody that was involved. And so, you know, we were real kind of protective of them and um, they probably didn't do uh, some of the stuff that they, they would have if this hadn't happened. And, you know, we really didn't feel like going on family vacations or, you know, it was just, we all turned depressed and we just kind of really didn't know how to deal with it because it, at the time, you know, we couldn't say a hundred percent, Oh, it's a death. So, you know, we're mourning, we're going through the, you know, the five stages of grief or, you know, whatever. We couldn't really say that because we were hoping he's still alive. And, you know, um, it's taken all these years now it, going on the 25th anniversary. It was like, well, you know, it doesn't sound like he is still alive, that something had to have happened at the very beginning. But because we didn't have any facts on it, we couldn't we couldn't mourn properly or we couldn't deal with it. And um, like I said, it, it really affected the whole, our family dynamics and, you know, how our life would have been different. You, you feel like you're stuck in 1997. Uh, life hasn't really gone on. So. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. We love you people. You love us. We love you. It's a beautiful relationship. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, check out Oprah's number one podcast, Chris Rock's number one podcast, The Rock's number one podcast. All the important people are listening. Yeah. It's dynamite. Tell them the name. Rick Rubin's. <laughs> favorite podcast it's called off the record it's only on stitcher premium you can find it by going to our website truecrimegarage.com it's only five dollars a month stitcher premium is like the netflix for podcast listeners you get our content plus you get all the bonus content on whoever's on stitcher premium and there's tons of stuff and there's exclusive content that's just created for that platform five dollars a month it's amazing you're going to love it 
and stick around because we have a lot more to get to tomorrow in this case. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't miss. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.